Agencies Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps agencies streamline their proposals in the cloud and get faster sign-off. Welcome to the 19th episode of Agencies Drinking Beer. On today's episode, we're chatting with Chris Spurvey, who's going to teach us how to cultivate the sales mindset. Good spirits, very different spirits from the uh, interview we're about to hear. You were very, very cranky during that. Was I really? You were really mad. You were like, because it was, it was. Oh, the computer. The computer wasn't working. Yes. Something oh. wasn't working right, and uh, you were like, "I'm just, just, I'm not even going to sit in on this. I'm just going <laughs> to." <laughs> You're so cranky. Yeah. You're feeling good now, though. Feeling great. Good. Yeah. You know, I just, I'm like my dad. I took after him. He's thrown his laptop across the room a few times. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Because a lot of times people say, you no, know, but he really has. Has, yeah. Has that helped made it work better? Uh, no, but I asked him that question, but he he just felt better. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I guess he he can afford to do that. I guess I just feel remorse when I break things out of anger because I'm like, well, now it's twice as bad as it was yeah. a minute ago. I always crack up at people that break their knuckles because they hit the wall or something. Right. Yeah. I don't know who did that. Uh, Imagine if you broke your toe from kicking a oh, cabinet out of anger. That'd be crazy. Yeah. I forgot about that. I knew someone that did that. I forgot that. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, anyway, still feeling the pain from that. Wasn't worth it. No. Lesson to everyone. Mm. Violence against furniture doesn't solve anything. I'm also feeling really good because of all the vitamin D and the warm. You know me, I love warm weather. It's yeah. stinking hot out there. I'm loving it. And pretending you're in Florida. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, how about before we get into the interview, I want to uh, actually go through a question from a listener. Oh, nice. So somebody tweeted out to me. Uh, this was, uh, his at handle was Com M. So he asked, hey, exclamation point, read your monthly retainer post. Awesome. Uh, thanks. You think selling sites by monthly fees in brackets, site for $50 a month, is a good path. What do you think, Kevin? I told him we would answer it on the podcast. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Yeah, you know, that's a tough question. Sorry, but there's so many different variables. It depends mm. on the client, depends on the situation. What's the, uh, the true value of the site that you're building and why you're building the site? Mm. Uh, the quick answer is, I mean, if you can build up, you have to do volume. You can do enough of those. I mean, retainers are the way to go. We know that. Mm. But at 50 bucks a month? That's pretty low. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it depends what market you're in. If $50 U.S. is a lot if you're, mm. you know, from a, a country like Canada where our dollar's worth almost nothing. It's true, <laughs> which we benefit from. <laughs> um, right now. Yeah, in tourism. We'll pay for this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've got, let's say you have 500 or a couple hundred people that are doing that, then it's worth it. Um, well, I think, I mean, it's it's a loaded question, of course, and uh, there's a few, uh, obviously, like you said, a lot of variables at play. We're assuming that he means a custom website, hmm. you know, that you go through the process, you know, the design process with your client and you do up wireframes and mood boards and, you know, the standard kind of web design process that people go through. I mean... I guess the thought is we, you know, we talked to Scott Olford. I think it was our second podcast yeah, episode, yeah. and Scott did something similar. Where you know, usually when you're selling these kind of one-off website projects, you tend to kind of price the whole thing out. Maybe you do like a certain amount up front, half up front, or thirty percent up front, and then partway through the project, and then at the end. Um, and then you're kind of done, and once the site's launched, you get paid for it. And what Scott was saying he did was um, he would build them, I think, over a 12- to 18-month period in equal installments. So even long after the site has been launched, they're still paying on it. Uh, and how that's helped with cash flow. You don't get as much up front, but it helps over the long term. I think something like that could work. I mean, it's kind of a scary thing to do. Because, you, you know, more money up front is generally better, but I do see how that kind of gets you into the the rhythm of being able to predict your revenue better. I mean, $50 a month is $600 for the year. Yeah, think, think about it's that. It's not a lot of money. So what I may suggest is uh, taking 25% or 50% up front, as you just, as Scott does, 
and then maybe uh, prorate it for the rest of the year to pay off the rest of it. So mm. say if, so if it's a ten thousand dollars site, maybe charge five grand, and then take the other five grand and just charge, uh, mm. you know, potentially per uh, per month and just prorate it. Yeah. No easy answers. Is no, there, there isn't. I uh, wish I could help this guy out, but I, I think you know monthly, you know, and, and he's probably alluding to that. We have had a lot of well, some guests on, including Scott, that talk about the monthly, how important that is to build that up, mm. that retainer base. You know, so there's probably some upsells too. And if you do engage them in monthly, obviously there's some upselling opportunities along the way. Yeah, I I, I think Scott's point, um, his point when he was talking about it was that. Because the cl- the client is thinking of you every month when they pay that mm. bill, you're you know you you have this ongoing relationship so that they feel right. like they can pick up pick up the phone and call you or you can call them and it doesn't seem weird or out of place or like they're trying to you're trying to sell them or something. Mm. So it just creates more of that long term relationship. It's not like the you know what is often the case when you sell websites and you're kind of done. It's launched, pay your bill, boom. You don't really hear from the client again unless you really try yeah if you have a good relationship they're also not going to go out to RFP or look for anybody else potentially when they were looking for something else to build or something mm-hmm. to do they're going to come to you yeah potentially yeah it's a tough business that way mm, it is I can see like um, when people have it's say like a Shopify website or something where that's SaaS based where you pay monthly I could see having you know covering that charge for your client and then just having like you know there's this ongoing fee you pay for it my worry would just be the client like goes out of business or something mm, yes or just stops paying you because they're jerks that ha- that happens unfortunately it does I mean if, if the client I mean I remember we had this uh, client who shall re- remain nameless I'm sure nobody would know who they are anyway they were like a marina in Nova Scotia oh yeah yep. shining light <laughs> <laughs> so um, we wrote a jingle for them when we were drunk one night um, they never heard it. So, <laughs> you know, they had this thing where they um, they called us, I think, at Headspace, you know, a year, two years after we had launched the site and said, oh, something's broken on it. Can you fix it? And they didn't want to pay for any fixes because in their mind, they paid for that site. You you know, that whatever they paid for that it covers them forever. It's mm-hmm. like a lifetime warranty kind of thing. Yep. They didn't understand, like, the whole idea of, like, you know, it's kind of like a car when it breaks down you still got to pay to fix it and all that stuff so anyway my my worry just with paying like with not getting the money up front would just be that like after 12 months the client just decides you know what i feel like the site's launched why am i still paying this bill Mm. i'm not seeing anything more for it people are just it's true difficult yeah we've experienced that so maybe we've made it more confusing for uh (laughs) mafias i don't know I would love to hear what uh, the listeners think. Please, yeah, actually, that'd be great to get some more advice. Absolutely. Leave it in the comments below or um, or even send in your, your audio response. So how about we move on to the interview with Chris Spurvey? Okay, here we go. I'd like to welcome Chris Spurvey to the show. Uh, Chris is the VP of Business Development at KPMG. Um, that's your uh, day job, but you also are uh, doing a lot of stuff on the side. You've got a blog, you're writing a book, uh, you've got a podcast, you're doing a, a ton of stuff. You like chatting about sales and helping people sell better. So we're going to be chatting with Chris today on the program. Thank you for joining us, Chris. Oh, you're welcome, Kyle. I, I appreciate you inviting me on to your podcast. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool. So we've chatted a few times over the last couple of months because we kind of know some of the same uh, people in the you know Atlantic Canadian business uh, network. So uh, you know, one thing that you know, it's been really inspiring to see you over the last couple of months because I remember when we were chatting last, you were saying that um, you know you you've got a, a great job that you that you work at, you know, kind of in the daytime, but that you really wanted to build up your personal brand and, and start, you know, publishing content and writing a book. And so many of us want to do that, but very few of us actually do it. And you've done it. You're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. How has yeah. that been? Oh, it's been great. I mean, just the, the build on a couple of things that you, you mentioned there. Yeah. I mean, my, my, uh, 
my career uh, with KPMG is a, I've got a wonderful job. Uh, basically, I, I work in a, throughout Atlantic Canada, uh, mentoring our consultants and managers uh, uh, in the area of business development and sales. Uh, and that involves bo- both working with them one-on-one, but also out in the field, uh, mixing and intermingling with prospective clients for the firm. Uh, my main focus is IT advisory. Uh, so uh, we have a, a group of IT consultants throughout Atlantic Canada, and my main focus is finding work and working with those consultants to better their uh, careers from a business development pr- perspective. Because in order to, you know, to grow your career in one of these larger firms, you need to own a book of business. And uh, so that's my job is to help them grow their books of business. So. Uh, so from that perspective, it's great, and I really enjoy it. I learn a lot, and uh, I have a, a you know a fairly large network throughout Atlantic Canada. Uh, but you know, sales wasn't always easy for me. You know, I go back about uh, maybe 12 to 15 years ago. Uh, I was in a position where I, I just said I need to get out from behind the desk, and uh, you know, so I decided to take this plunge. I, I remember reading a book by Robert Kiyosaki called Rich Dad Poor Dad. And somewhere in that book, he, he bleeds out the message that, you know, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, but you can't because you have a family and, and, a, and, a, and a situation whereby, you know, your, your family is relying on you from an income perspective, uh, so you can't leave your full-time job, why don't you try sales? And so I decided to look into that. So, uh, but when I got into it, I kind of started falling flat on my face and, and you know, a lot of things from my childhood, certain things that happened to me as a child began to, you know, come forward and I uh, found myself kind of falling over myself and throwing up over my prospective clients and thinking I was getting closer to a sale, but not really, uh, you know. And uh, so, you know, basically, though, through the through a five or six year process, I got to a point where I became more comfortable with it. So the book, uh, just to touch on that, is really the process I went to went through and documenting that process uh, to become more of an effective salesperson and believe that I could be a more effective salesperson. Uh, so the process has been amazing. I, I uh, the last year I've poured myself into writing this book and and begin to grow my personal brand around salesmanship and uh, helping other people do what I did. So you um, chat about we'll chat about the book in a sec. Now, one thing I just wanted to jump back to is you said that. Um, you know, part of part of why sales was a, a struggle for you and a challenge was something that happened in your childhood or things that happened in your childhood. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a bunch of things, you know. I mean, I can tell all kinds of little stories of, you know, things that happened in, happened in my childhood which made me who I was up to that particular point, you know. Uh, I, I, I remember growing up and uh, there being a knock on the door on a Sunday evening when we're eating Sunday, Sunday dinner uh, or supper, whatever it was, and mom and dad or mom going to the door and it being the Electrolux salesperson and uh, dad, mom letting them in. And once he got into his pitch, there was no stopping this guy. And no matter what, so they, he was offering a $2,000 vacuum and uh, mom and dad would throw objections at him, and he had an answer for everything. He was as slick as slick can be. And, uh, you know, mom and dad ended up buying a $2,000 vacuum that night that they didn't really want <laughs> to buy from a financial perspective because they couldn't get rid of this guy. So, uh, wow. so that, yeah, Good. I mean, and then they fought, for, uh, they fought for a couple of months over the $2,000 they spent on this vacuum that they really didn't need. <laughs> but don't, <laughs> Why'd you don't listen to him? Why do you? Yeah, exactly. And and I watched mom and dad as they as I as I observed this interaction happening. I uh, you know I, I I remember seeing them tense up and and trying to make eye contact with each other to be able to make a a, a mutual decision. But this guy was just so uh, forward uh, and extroverted and and type A personality. All those things that we hear or where many people think that sales is all about. And, uh, you know, they couldn't communicate because of uh, one-on-one in order to make the decision. Now, you know, in hindsight... So you looked at that and you thought, I could profit from people's misery. This is amazing. <laughs> well, but I looked at it and, and said, no, I mean, I, I, I would never want to be a salesperson because that's not what I want to be like, you know. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, a, there's all kinds of little stories from childhood that, 
that, you know, don't lay a good foundation to be a leader even, you know. Uh, you know, I remember moving to a school in grade five, and this might sound very subtle and very small, but I remember in grade five, mom and dad moving me to a new school, and they, uh, I was wearing the school uniform for uh, the previous school that I was in, and this new school had no uniform. So grade five, I walked into this, this new classroom, and I was looked at like I had 10 heads, because here I'm wearing this geeky uniform, and, you know, you know how you are in grade five, you know, you're trying, everyone is trying to, uh, uh, to create their own personality. So I became picked on for the first few months in that new school until I, you know, started to form my own identity. And one of that, that new identity I formed was that I did pretty well anything to uh, get the approval and the appreciation of others, you know, uh, in order to gain friendship. So that's not a great thing to bring into your adulthood, uh, you're basically following, uh, you know, following the leader uh, when you're moving into your adulthood with that type of a foundation in your personality. Uh, so, you know, basically those are the types of things I, I would imagine we've all experienced uh, at different times in our lives, and that's basically who make us who we are. And in order to be effective in sales or in any leadership role, you need to think, remember these uh, remember these childhood experiences and and you know form new beliefs about yourself. You know. Don't you wish that you read uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad when you're younger? And my 13 year old, that's the next book I'm having him read. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, if I think about when I was exposed to Rich Dad Poor Dad, and and I got into personal development, I suppose early in my 20s. I, uh, you know, I mentioned this the story about uh, gaining the approval of others. Well, one of the things that I associated, one of the associations I made at a young age was, uh, I remember back in some like grade seven or grade eight, going to McDonald's with my friends, and all of a sudden I became the cheeseburger eating eating uh, champion because I could I could eat the most cheeseburgers and. My buddies used to, stop, you know, put their hands on the table and and rah rah me on. So I interpreted that as gaining friendship. And so, but when I found myself in my early twenties at 270 pounds or 290 pounds, whatever I was, um, I I really realized that I had to do something to. Uh, and so, personal development. Uh, I remember. I remember being introduced to uh, Tony Robbins and personal power, and uh, those are the types of things that started to change me, and that led me then to Robert Kiyosaki with Rich Dad Poor Dad, and creating new associations for how we make money, you know, and and building assets versus li uh, versus focusing on liabilities and and creating debt in our lives, you know. So yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, yeah, I, mean, I wish uh, certainly we all should be exposing our children to books like Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad at a, at a young age. So speaking of books, you're, you're writing one now called uh, Cultivating the Sales Mindset. So can you talk about kind of what's in the book and what, it, what is the sales mindset? So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the subtitle. Uh, the, the main title for the book is called It's Time to Sell. Uh, so basically I, I have this vision in my mind that's very clear. Uh, entrepreneurs, when they go into business, they have this vision for their product or service that they spend months or maybe even years building and they build the product and then they go about and they start to say, holy smokes, it's time to sell because they have to create revenue for their company. And, and so that's when these sort of childhood limiting beliefs start to form or start to come forward that hold them back from getting out there and talking to to people about their product or service with the right level of belief and conviction that they need in order to, I guess, transfer that belief or conviction to their prospective client that they do need uh, this, this particular product or service. Um, so, you know, and I, I guess building on that, I'm the past chair of the Technology Association here in Newfoundland. Uh, I don't think we've noted that. I'm from Newfoundland, Canada. The accent said it all. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I don't even know if a lot of the listeners, uh, like a lot of people, are from the states. So I don't even know if they'll be able to distinguish the difference between our uh, maritime accents. But uh, but for all of you listening, that is a that is a true Newfie accent right there. <laughs> I don't find it that strong, actually, compared to a lot of my Newfie friends. Yeah, yeah, I've been told that my uh, my accent. Maybe it's because. You know, uh, I, through my day-to-day -day interactions, the majority of the people I interact with are certainly, yeah, in the United States as well. And, and 
and Ontario, so maybe it's been taken out of me over time, but uh, I've been told I sound like I have a French accent, I've been told I sound like I have an Irish accent, but anyway, I'm just glad I'm proud to be What's that? I think that is a Newfie accent, it's like a a French-Irish mix. French Irish mix, exactly. Yeah, I think I had someone tell me I'm yeah. from Tex- uh, I sound like I was from Texas at one point in time. I don't think I, I can't, I can't <laughs> hear that. <laughs> no, I don't hear that. Wow, either. that's weird. No, no. So, uh, how many after how many uh, shots of screech does it really start to come back though in full force? <laughs> when do you sound like Brad Pitt from Snatch? <laughs> well, uh, shots of screech for me. It might, it'll only take three, and I'm uh, I'm on the floor anyway. So. Uh, I often joke, uh, I remember a few years ago being down in the Dominican Republic and there was this guy in, in the uh, the waiting pool um, and he used to come over me because he knew, come, come over to me because he knew I was, I was from Newfoundland and told me these Newfie jokes and uh, finally I got to the point uh, where I said to him, I said, what's black and blue and lays on the floor? And he said, what? And I said, it's going to be you if you keep telling them Newfie jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's not fair at all. The the Newfie jokes are not fair. There's uh, many of the smartest people I know have come from uh, from Newfoundland, and you are one of them. So, how has uh, how has been you know being out of Newfoundland? Where I mean, really, it's it's not that far away from us. But I mean, Atlantic Canada as a whole is very sort of stuck out there in the ocean, and and doesn't really get thought of a whole lot or included in the wider business community. Has that been a challenge for you, just geographically where you're located? Uh, I, I would suggest that I personally I've taken advantage of that uh, thus far in my career whereby, you know, when I look at Newfoundland, my, my career began to take a, a very positive uh, movement forward when I joined an IT consulting company and it was right at the beginning of the oil boom here in Newfoundland. So Newfoundland is experiencing a, an economic boom as a result of the oil uh, industry in Newfoundland. Now recently with the oil prices going down. But the, you know, to get to my point, really Newfoundland uh, has been a great place to do business in the last number of years. And uh, so I've taken advantage of that, uh, especially from the, uh, you know, our, our main client being the public sector government. Uh, wh- and whereby, you know, you, I mentioned the story of KPMG and how I'm vice president of business development for KPMG. But prior to that, we were a small independent IT consulting company that got some significant growth as a result of the influx of oil money here in Newfoundland, and that's what led to the acquisition by KPMG. So, um, so I took advantage of that, I suppose, to a certain extent. I will say diversification and growing outside of Newfoundland and the Atlantic provinces. Yes, it's it's not as easy as people would think. We 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 are out there a little ways, and you know, for New- Newfoundland, it's in its own time zone, for God's sakes. Uh, so. Uh, but you know, uh, for every for every challenge, there is an opportunity, and uh, you know. So I'd like to believe we 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 can we can overcome the challenges here in Atlantic Canada and and prosper. You know, there's so much great stuff here in in Atlantic Canada. Great great opportunity to create a lifestyle around your business, and so that's that's kind of the things that I try to focus on as much as I can. I mean, here I am, 41 years old, and. You know, I live in a great province, and I can have a, a cottage that's 40 minutes from my home, and and we can live on a live on a lake, uh, and and those types of things are the things that I try to focus on. You know. Mm. Well, let's face it, too. Danny Williams did a lot for you guys. I mean, that's true leadership, in my opinion. And you know, and I often use his name. Even I'm from the states originally. I tell people down there about him. They have no idea who he is, but just his accomplishments and the fact that he did it for the right reasons. He went in there and did what he needed tell to do. Tell the listeners who Danny Williams is. Past premier of uh, Newfoundland, um, went in and actually didn't take a paycheck, uh, became probably a billionaire, I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, through the ca- through uh, introducing cable and, and whatnot uh, into Newfoundland, am I right? Yeah, yes. I don't, I don't know about a billionaire, but he's not far off, uh, but uh, yeah. maybe he is through his most, multiple assets, I don't know, but uh, his big main claim to fame from a business perspective is, yes, bringing cable to Newfoundland and then selling it to Rogers, uh, I believe it was probably 15 years ago. He's now currently building a, uh, I think it's a $300 million uh, new like sort of residential area that's going to be the size of Gander, which is uh, probably the fourth or fifth largest community in Newfoundland. So it's a completely separate uh, area of St. John's that he's uh, he owns all the land and is putting in the infrastructure and laying the groundwork for, for growth here in St. John's, you know? That's brilliant. Yeah, cool. yeah. 
Yeah, so it's a great place. I must say, I wouldn't. Uh, outside of the weather, the weather uh, is uh, something to be desired. But uh, you know, we, because we have a lot of rain drizzle and fog. But uh, again, you think to go with the bad. Take the fleas with the dog, so to speak. <laughs> and it, from what I hear, it's not too much different in you know Seattle or Vancouver or any any kind of coastal city. Um, so I wanted to just chat more about the uh, this idea of like cultivating the sales mindset, and that that um, that kind of subtitle resonated with me because I remember uh, when I started my first business, which was a freelance bit, you know, design development business. Um, previously, I had worked at agencies as a designer. I didn't really touch sales too much, and I didn't really have any formal, you know, training or a lot of experience with sales. Um, so my freelance career was kind of my first jumping off point at really having to go out there and, and bring in clients. And I remember uh, Kevin and I worked together at an agency and Kevin really, cause Kevin's uh, been doing sales for, for many years before that point where we had met and he kind of gave me some coaching and some, some good tips and, and good uh, kind of trained me up to be a, a salesman. I don't know how well I did, but it definitely was, you know, okay. really, really important. So, you know, what, I guess what kind of advice would you give to somebody who uh, maybe they're entrepreneurial or they've got a great product or a great skill they want to sell, but they just don't feel confident, like they don't have a lot of um, experience with sales? How do they get started? How do they kind of get out there and start, start winning clients? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's probably a, an answer that could be extremely long or could be very short. I mean, I come at, I come at it from uh, initially what I refer to as the inner game of sales, uh, whereby you know you're. So I told you some stories about my childhood, which led me, you know, when I got into sales, it I got to a point where I really didn't believe in my heart that I was able to do it. Uh, and in order to get around that, I really needed needed to change some of those early beliefs or visions that I have. And you know, in order to be successful in entrepreneurship and sales, and I think they're both very very much the same and similar, is you know we need to have self motivation and we need to have you know cre- you know all the various aspects of self motivation. From my vantage point, are creativity, enthusiasm, belief, and these things that allow us to push forward on a daily basis uh, with a consistency in our activity. And, um, in, you know, I get, I've basically proven to myself that unless I'm inherently self-motivated, then I will not do these things on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, because they're just going against what we see, uh, how we see ourselves. So how do you create this self-motivation that's going to allow you to drive forward with, uh, with this consistency and this drive and, and fire on, uh, behind us? And really what I've proven to myself is that unless you have a, a, a vision for your life that is something more than you currently have, then, you know, you're not going to get this self-motivation and, uh, you know, you're going to continue to waffle and, and, you know, look at your current scenario as either, you know, good enough or, uh, or whatever. So, so, you know, we need to have a vision for our life that is something more than what we currently have. And, and so, you know, we talk about the book that I've written. Really, the book that I've written uh, kind of concludes with the creation of this vision that uh, includes you as an individual, me as an individual out there work, serving and working with our clients. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it changes that pre- past programming from, you know, believing that sales is something we have to push on people to change people's minds, it, cha- it changes that inherent vision we have for ourselves to being more of a partnership scenario where you are of service to your prospective clients. And then when you have that vision and you're, you're instilling that new vision in your mind, uh, over time your activities begin to basically change and move in the direction of that new positive vision that you have for yourself. Um, so I guess that's a high-level overview. So it's very much an inner game piece, uh, inner game puzzle uh, out of the gate. And the outer game tactics and techniques of, you know, meeting new people, putting people into your funnel, talking to them about your product or service, presenting your product or service, moving towards a, a sale, closing that particular prospect, those are all outer game things that kind of spill out as a result of a, a new vision that you have for yourself. So that's a, I'll kind of stop there because that's kind of a high-level overview. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, so kind of what I'm hearing is that, you know, there's 
there's the tips and there's the strategies and there's the very tactical kind of things that you know can help with sales but really where it needs to start is you use the term inner game which actually I kind of associate with um, a term some pickup artists use you know as far as how to uh, how to score more or whatever in, in the bedroom is you know this like inner game of I don't know just being very confident and knowing your worth and and you know I, I would I would think that when people are out there in the in the the dating game trying to pick up people it's probably similar in some ways to sales because you're putting yourself out there you know you only really the confidence uh, the confident people seem to do well um, I'm sure there's some correlation there there's some similarities there that we can touch on but you know for you know what you're saying is in, unless you believe internally that what you're and I agree with this uh, that what you're really trying to provide people like if you're selling that two thousand dollar vacuum cleaner you've got to really believe it's going to bring more than two thousand dollars of value to the people who buy it because if you're just trying to sell shit or you don't really you're not really confident about what you're selling you know all the tricks and tactics and techniques in the world aren't gonna aren't gonna help you I can just say a couple words on that very very quickly sure. if, uh, because uh, you know I, I guess if I go back, there's a time back about 10 years ago where this whole uh, idea of attraction and the law of attraction and this whole, there was a movie out called The Secret and I, mm. I, I, I'm listening to you speaking there and I feel like we, uh, we're, we're kind of touching, we're getting closer to that whole, I don't know what it's called, metaphysical or spiritual side of things. I guess, you know, I, I don't go that deep with it. I, uh, I don't, I can kind of stay a little bit of, uh, above that, but but basically we're definitely operating in a game of attraction, whereby you know if if we are not like if we are not putting forward a personality that is likable and uh, um, you know then we are not going to get very far. If we are an abrasive personality, we cannot. Get, I, I've never met a really good abrasive uh, sales individual or entrepreneur, for that matter. I suppose they. Um, the abrasive entrepreneurs are typically surrounded by, you know, good, nice, uh, quality people who are are out there in front in the front line offering the product or service. So it's you know I do believe building on that whole relationship or dating uh, scenario you mentioned, we're definitely operating in an uh, in an attraction type of environment uh, with these concepts and and so um, yeah so I mean I think. I think we do need to set ourselves up in such a way that we believe, yes, in our product, but first and foremost, we need to believe in ourselves and uh, in our abilities to to go forward and and you know it really starts the inner the, and the inner game is really really that all about that. Um, the term inner game, interestingly enough, comes from a really good book that I recommend to your listeners called The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, it's a phenomenal book by Timothy Galway uh, and. He basically uh, is a tennis instructor, but he begins uh, by teaching people um, to recognize their own inner abilities and, you know, express their own inner abilities on the tennis courts and stop stop trying too hard and seizing up uh, to make these these improvements. Uh, you know, so the inner game of tennis is a phenomenal book. Uh, and whereby inner the inner game is the mindset you have towards tennis, and the outer game is is like you mentioned the tactics and techniques that we we focus on once the inner game is in place. Something you said um, before this, before we kind of talked to the inner game, but it's closely related, was the idea of like you said, have you know you kind of need to have this vision for where you want your life to be, and that that resonated with me because I remember the whole reason I went freelance because I never saw myself as an entrepreneur before. I always thought I was, was going to be working for somebody else, you know, and have somebody else run the business and I'll just kind of do my thing. But what really pushed me forward was I had this, you know, um, this idea of what I wanted my life to be like with the freedom, the flexibility of being a business owner. But I knew that in order to have that, I needed to have clients and I needed to have sales and I needed to kind of do the other, you know, the other stuff that's maybe not as fun when it comes to running a business. So that kind of pushed me out of my shell to, to sell. And I think it was probably that way with a lot of people is, um, you know, I, Kevin's one of those rare freaks who loves to sell, like actually enjoys going out and meeting new people and chatting about their business. And I'm just not that person. So I've got to push myself more. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I would I would say that today I'm Kevin, but uh, 15 years ago I was like you, Kyle. Uh, so I'm I'm not a natural born salesperson. There's a really good book called To Sell as Human by Dan Pink, and in that book, uh, really, there's a study done by Adam Grant. Uh, he's he's one of the uh, think of the University of Pennsylvania, whereby he studied salespeople. And uh, the the most effective salespeople are not extroverts, uh, nor are they introverts, but they're closer to introverts than they are extroverts. So on a scale of one to ten, the best quality salespeople are either a three, somewhere around a three to three or you know three point five. Uh, so because you know yes yes they have when they push themselves. So if I look at me. I can push, I push myself a little bit to go out and get into larger groups and begin networking, uh, you know, so, but I need to have the, kind of the frameworks in my mind in order to get over some of those early stumbling blocks, uh, you know, and the frameworks being, you know, when I meet somebody, I think about, okay, well, what can I talk to them about their family? What can I talk to them about their occupation? And, and what can I talk to them about their, their recreation and what they'd like to do in their pastime? Um, and uh, what motivates them. So like I just mentioned, F-O-R-M, that stands for form. So that's a framework or uh, just a, a something I have in my mind when I go into large groups. Uh, I When I start to talk to somebody, I will talk, try my hardest to talk to them about their family, their occupation, their recreation, or their motivation. And so that gives me a framework. So I'm not, natu- I'm not naturally good at getting out and, and meeting people and talking to people, you know, but I, once I had a framework in my mind, I was able to get out there and do it, you know? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too. I've had so many people sell me really well that they can't sell. And I'm like, well, you just sold me. Hmm. You know, it, it amazes me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're dead on. I see that all the time, uh, especially in my business. I mean, so KPMG... We've got these, uh, you know, these consultants and these uh, uh, associates. I mean, these are in, these are new people just graduated from uh, university, and I don't, I don't, I can't, I cannot suggest university sets you up to be an entrepreneur or, or a sales professional. And I, again, I, I take the two of them, and I really think they're both one and of the same. Entrepreneurs and, and sales professionals, they have a lot of the same characteristics. In other words, they have a desire for something more, and. And so, but when I meet these new uh, uh, associates who are just joining the firm, very seldom do I have a person say to me, I'm a natural salesperson. But then when I get in and I talk to them, within 15 minutes, I can see all the great skills and, and, and great communication techniques that they, that they have that they don't even believe they have. And, and really, that's, that's where all the, in order to be effective at sales, you just tap into some of that, some of that, in, some of those things that you you know you're you're naturally good at because you know I think most of us are naturally good at some of this stuff. The, there seems to be two sides to sales, right? The first is lead generation and being able to you know find leads and, and nurture them and get them you know to the point where they're you can where they're really interested in what you're selling. And I've always found that where I personally have struggled has been on that side more because once I've got somebody coming to me saying, hey, I'm interested in buying what you're selling, whether it's a service or a product, really good at the presentation and answering questions at, you know, closing the deal. I mean, that's always been kind of my thing, but I haven't been, I mean, that that framework of form of being able to kind of think of those different things you want to learn about somebody um, really helps because, and that's what Kevin's always been really good at is that upfront you know, going to a, an event or a conference or a networking kind of thing and being able to talk to a lot of people and then come away with, okay, these are the people I want to follow up with and these people might be interested in the service. That is a lot harder And that's why we were such a good team, I think, you know, with the agency. I would go and do that and then I'd bring him in. And Kyle's such a great presenter when it gets down to the nitty-gritty and what we're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, it worked out well. Still does. <laughs> I've, I've leveraged that type of a scenario in my career as well whereby I'm – Although you know, I said I'm not as effa- I'm not naturally good at what you're referring to, Kevin. That you're good at um, that that door opening and and the kind of the navigating piece of sales. Uh, uh, but I suppose you know, in, in hindsight, really that's what I've become effective at over the years. But I always have working with me the the person who's really qualified, subject matter expert, uh, and is able to present. 
the product or service uh, with with some with with confidence and in the knowledge that uh, of the internal workings of the product or service. So I've been able to leverage a similar situation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find it's rare to find somebody who's really good at both pieces? Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, I think it's a matter of learning. I suppose. Like, I mean, I, I would. I would suggest I'm capable of sitting down and and learning. Like, I remember when I first uh, graduated from university, my my role. I joined an insurance company at the time, Johnson Insurance, and I joined as their manager of e strategy or e business. I forget the exact title. But we, we built a members-only website. Uh, this is back in the late 90s, um, maybe mid, mid to late 90s. And so my job became to go around the country and to present the members-only website to prospective clients as a benefit. So, so large groups and associations uh, that Johnson's were looking at to become you know, uh, large group insurance companies, I would present the, the members only website as a reason to join, to use Johnson's as your, as your group carrier, uh, or group insurance client. So, uh, you know, I guess I was actually, I, I was known within Johnson's at that time for being effective at getting up, up in front of these groups, sometimes 20 people, sometimes 500 people and presenting the members only websites, the inner workings of it, and then being able to relay kind of the member benefit to the the groups I was talking to. So I, I, I guess I'm using that as an example of being able to play both sides of it. Uh, you know, that, that job didn't involve getting out and really uh, creating leads as such. It was being able to relay the features and benefits uh, to the group that I was presenting to in much the same way I'm sure, Kyle, you're doing it when you're presenting it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. It's so much easier once you've got somebody who's interested. Like, that's kind of the hardest thing. And, and maybe what, you know, you're talking about some misconceptions people have about, you know, salesmen or saleswomen, and it's, it's that. They're, they're, they're trying to push something on people that they don't want, but really that's a very small piece of sales. I mean, you could, have, let's say somebody who's really bad at sales, you know, they could take somebody who comes in interested in what they're buying or what they're selling and and not close the deal because they just, you know, they don't really push for it or they don't communicate in the right way or, you know, I don't know. A lot of the there. mistakes they make is they're just not good listeners and, you know, and, and they, and the, yeah, and they're just firing all these stats and whatever they're selling, it, it just information overload. Where, you know, when I, uh, one of the first sales jobs I had, believe it or not, was selling time sharing right out of, um, right out of school, out of university. And you talk about, um, I mean, I had these crusty Zig Ziglar types training me, you know, and uh, they even wore the, wore the, the, the lime green pants and, you know, and um, I just learned so much though. I learned how to listen and, and, you know, they used to describe it like a basketball game. Someone throws you the ball, well, throw it back, make them, have them make the play in a sense, you know. Great question, why do you ask? I mean, I know that sounds trivial, but a lot of people don't ask questions to people they're trying to sell to. Hmm. I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see. Yeah, I uh, I posted a new post. I posted a post on LinkedIn about two months ago, and I uh, I just asked the broad question: uh, What is the best sales advice you've ever received? Uh, and I kind of directed then the post to I think it was about thirty of my connections who are in the sales profession. And if you go back and look at all the comments, so I, I invited them to comment on the article, and I think all but one of them, if you read the advice. You can walk away from from each of the comments and say, well, that all what what that person is basically saying is we need to be effective listeners. Uh, so I think it was say 20 out of 21 people who commented said we need to be better listeners, uh, or or the best advice I ever received was to be listening first. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of a uh, and I, I might not get the exact specifics of the study down, but uh, there was a, a number of years ago a, a psychologist. Uh, got on a plane and sat up in first class speaking to a business executive and uh, they recorded the conversation um, and basically the psychologist would ask the business executive questions 
And then at the end of the plane ride, the business executive got off and was interviewed. And the the guy, the, the interviewer said, "What what is you know how would you describe the person who was sitting next to you on the plane?" And the business executive said, "That person that person was the most interesting person I've ever spoken to." And so then they went back and they looked at the, the transcription of the actual conversation. And the psychologist who was talking to the business executive only spoke for nine percent of the time. The rest <laughs> of the time, he asked questions and allowed the business executive to do all the talking. Uh, so, um, so that's so, that's a great bang example. On, you know? bang the on. moral of the story is: if you want to seem interesting, keep your mouth shut. Right. Well, let's face it. People love to talk about themselves. That's why that dude felt like it was an interesting conversation because he got to hear himself speak and probably talked all about his accomplishments and things he did. And that's sales. That's what you do. This person's very interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's the way it is, man. (laughs) Well, listening is you know that's one of those skills that can serve not just in sales but lots of different aspects of life. It makes you a better designer. It makes you a better podcast interviewer. And it's so it's funny that we find it so hard to do because we're always I think it's just a natural thing, especially when you're, you know, type A kind of person is you're always thinking about what next, what, what's the next thing I'm going to say instead of really concentrating and really trying to hear not just what somebody's saying, but what they mean, you know, the, the bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have found just in this conversation, I have found myself actually three times so far, I've said to myself, I've interrupted you guys. Uh, when I when I should have let you finish your statement, so no one's a professional. It's hard to be uh, an expert in listening because I've I, like I said I've actually caught myself in this in this conversation not listening. I'm 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 waiting. I'm wanting to jump at your uh, and answer what I think you're asking me. <laughs> it's harder on the with the technology too because uh, you can't see you in somebody's you know you don't have that body language either. And it sometimes a delay. there's a delay. Yeah. yeah. So you're totally forgiven. Um, Chris, I want to thank you for being on the show. I, before we uh, before we sign off, I wanted you so tell people where they can hear more uh, tips on sales, how they can learn how to cultivate the sales mindset. Where should they go to look for that? Yeah, I mean my my spot on the internet is my is my own name. It's uh, Chris Spurvey S P U R V E Y dot com, and and uh, I send out a Sunday morning. Uh, newsletter, which is basically I get up and, and type up a, a, a personal story, a relay, and in, deep in those stories are, are messages that I think anybody who is wanting to uh, get better at sales can benefit from. I'm, I'm basically trying to put myself out there as the human guinea pig for everything sales, uh, and you know I'm not afraid to share the, me falling flat on my face as I go. So if you can learn from me, certainly subscribe to my newsletter. Uh, in terms of my book, it's coming out uh, early September, and I'm about two or three days away from putting up the first three chapters as a free download on my website. And uh, I, I think it's uh, I think the first three chapters lay the groundwork for what the, what the book is about. So uh, feel free to uh, go to the website and download the first three chapters. Are you going to be coming to Halifax anytime soon? Oh, yeah. I'm in Halifax. Uh, I would say I'll be there, won't be next week, but certain, uh, within a month I'll be definitely in Halifax. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm in and out of Halifax at least once a month. Yeah, look us up. We'll go for dinner. Yeah, sounds really good. I, I, I appreciate you guys inviting me. It's been a lot of fun and, uh, and sharing it in very uh, natural sharing the message in a very natural form instead of like a, a one-off a question and answer type format is a lot of fun. Yeah, if I always find true conversations, you always, you know, come away with something or, or a subject is brought up that you wouldn't have thought of if you were just typing it out in an email, you know? So true. So true. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Kevin, I look forward to meeting you. Kyle and I have had uh, five or six really good conversations, so I look forward to uh, learning what, learning your background as well. Excellent. And I didn't follow up on anything that we talked about when we chatted last, but you've clearly uh, followed through on everything you said you were going to do. So we're going to link to the, uh, the your site and also uh, the book when... Uh, it's available, and um, people should definitely check that out. Thanks again for being on the show, Chris. All right. Thanks a million. Talk to you later. Have All right. Have a good one. So aren't you glad you sat in on that, that interview with Chris? Yes. You I, almost didn't. You I almost, almost bailed. left. Yeah, because we had to use your machine. I wasn't happy with what was going on. Yeah. The battery was dead in my, in my machine. You were just having a fit. Yeah, I just really uh, I like talking sales. The guy was great. Yeah. He's a Newfoundlander. you got to love Newfoundlanders, and they're natural-born salespeople. You think? Yeah, they're Why? so friendly and they're, they're just they're great. There's, there's no grumpy newfies. 
There's going to be newfies, but there for some reason you, you just trust newfies. <laughs> when I was That's over true. there, I I, uh, I picked up a hitchhiker every time I saw one because so I just felt like I could trust them. Really? Yeah, I was there for three weeks working. That's that's good. You yeah. just had a whole truckload of I, uh, I think homeless it, people. No, I, yeah, I think uh, along the way, I, I mean, I, I say I picked. I mean, I think it was a half a dozen people I picked up over the course of three weeks. Yeah, but there's a lot of road to cover there. None know? of them tried to make you squeal like a pig. Cool. Well, uh, hope you enjoyed the interview. And actually, I want to uh, say something before we go, which is that we, we actually just this week launched our new blog, Proposify blog. So whereas before we were kind of just using the blog to talk about some product updates. So we're kind of back into the swing of things. I was doing this a little bit last year, uh, writing some some more value driven content posts, um, not just about product updates, but about how to sell better or, um, you know, agency kind of stuff. But uh, now with Jen on board as our marketing manager, she and I are each going to be writing an article per week. Plus, of course, we'll be tapping into the, the glorious well of knowledge that is Kevin Springer uh, for some information. So now there, there's going to be two posts every week. If you haven't already, sign up to the uh, blog updates um, to get emailed when we launch a new post. And I would love to hear any ideas you have for future posts. Um, the one I did this week was, was quite personal. Mm, was, uh, yeah. About uh, what being raised in a cult taught me, taught me about sales. Did this this sales uh, interview have anything to do with kind of instigating the fact that you wanted to talk about how it related to sales or not? I've had um, I've had sort of an idea for that post for a long time, but yeah. I just wasn't sure quite how to angle it. So now that the blog is going to be more kind of like business and sales driven, it's still we're touching on agency stuff a little bit, but it's not quite just talking about agency stuff. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, I've always said that was one of the takeaways of me being raised in a cult was that I got, you know, I had to do public speaking every week and, you know, kind of forced me to, to learn that stuff. It's a, it's a glass half full title. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, this was like a drop of water in a big empty glass, but. Yeah, but hey, <laughs> you, you got some benefit. Silver lining you got, scenario. You got benefit from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. Well, check out the post. Love to hear what you think. Uh, and as always, send in your questions and comments. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.